I know right now there is not a man in this planet that can stop me inside this octagon, and only politics can slow me. I don't have much left to say other than you have seen nothing yet. <laughs> It's time! You're listening to the Cage Nation TV Prize Fight Podcast. Coming to you from the Coastal Cameron Studios in Wilmington, North Carolina. Are you ready? Here's your host, the big fella, Albert Cameron. Let's get it on! Thank you for joining me for the Prize Fight Podcast, ladies and gentlemen. I am your host, the big fella. Mr. Albert Cameron, and I would like to open the Prize Fight Podcast with a very sincere, a very open apology. Uh, there is a very good chance that the Prize Fight Podcast today might sound kind of hurried, kind of rushed, kind of uh, non extemporaneously prepared. The reason for that being is I had a whole script ready to go about how I felt about Conor McGregor and Floyd Money Mayweather Jr coming together for a boxing match and I just threw it away. I said, I'm not doing it anymore. I'm not giving hype any attention whenever there is real news out there. There is real things to talk about. I did not feel justified entertaining just the constant stream of of nonsense that's been coming out of that camp. It was a sure thing. Oh, the fight's been agreed to. This is what's going to happen. And then you got people coming out and saying, oh, no, it's not. Both Floyd Mayweather... And Dana White have said, there's nothing, there's no substance to this fight. Well, Dana White, uh, as much as I love everything he's done for the sport, everything that he has produced, I cannot take the man at his word when it comes to business. Because he swore up and down that the UFC was not for sale. And guess what? It sold for $4 billion. So, I understand the man needs to protect his business interests, and that is completely fine. Uh... But as far as me wasting breath on how I feel it's going to go down, I'm just, I I can't do it this week. You know, I I can't. I I just, I can't. Uh, If it happens, great. I'll make sure to buy the pay-per-view. And then we'll talk about it. But I refuse to give it any more attention outside of this diatribe until both men have laced up and the bell for round number one has rung. Then and only then. So, what we are going to talk about on the Prize Fight Podcast this week is that George St. Pierre is back. We're going to talk about some of his potential fights. And we're going to talk about media litigation negotiations, another stem of the Conor McGregor hissy fit tactic. Christiane Cyborg Justino has been cleared of anti-doping violations, and it couldn't have come at a better time, especially when the UFC needs to make a big impact with their women's featherweight division. And boxing is beginning to take away some market share. If you guys remember earlier this year when I made my yearly predictions, I said this might be happening. Well... Uh, There's some new evidence coming out, and we're going to talk about it all right here on the Prize Fight Podcast. Don't go nowhere. This week in MMA history. This week in MMA history, February 19th through February 25th. February 23rd, 2013 at UFC 157, Rousey versus Carmouche. Rowdy Ronda Rousey and Liz Carmouche make UFC history by being the first women to ever compete in the Ultimate Fighting Championship. Rousey was able to defend her Women's Bantamweight Championship in the main event. February 20th, 2010 at UFC 110, Noguera vs. Velasquez. The UFC makes its first ever trip to Australia. The event had grossed over $540,000 in merchandise sales, shattering the UFC 83 record of $498,000. February 23rd, 2008 at Strikeforce at the Dome. Former NFL football player and legend of Japan, the beast Bob Sapp made his North American MMA debut. Sapp would lose the bout to Jan Nortje in 55 seconds of round number one by technical knockout. February 24, 2007, Pride 33 second coming. Pride FC would hold their last United States fight card at the Thomas & Mack Center in Las Vegas, Nevada. It would turn out to be one of the last two Pride events before being purchased by Zufa LLC, Most notably on the card, Nick Diaz's win over the fireball kid Takanori Gomi by Gogo Plata was overturned due to Diaz testing for positive for marijuana. February 24th, 2002 at Pride 19, 
The infamous grudge fight between the world's most dangerous man Ken Shamrock and the predator Don Fry went down in Saitama, Japan. Shamrock was freshly out of his WWF tenure and took great offense to comments made about him by Fry. Despite walking away with two broken ankles, the Predator Don Fry got the decision victory. February 23, 2001 at UFC 30 Battle on the Boardwalk UFC 30 would be the first event held by the UFC under the Zufa LLC banner. It would also be the first home video release since UFC 22. At the historic event, the Bantamweight division was renamed Lightweight. The New York badass Phil Baroni, the muscle shark Sean Shurik, and the king of rock and roll Elvis Sinosek would make their UFC debut. Welcome back to the Price Fight Podcast, everybody. I am your host, the big fella, Mr. Albert Cameron. And before we get into talking about George St. Pierre coming back to the Ultimate Fighting Championship, I want to give a big shout out to the Shooting Star Podcast. You can find them online at soundcloud.com slash themacattack. SoundCloud.com slash T H E M A C A T T A K. They got a good thing going. They're seven episodes in. They talk about WWE. They're very, very thorough. A lot of fun to listen to. So go check them out. If professional wrestling is your thing, check out the Shooting Star podcast. Tell them that Cage Nation TV, the Prize Fight podcast, sent you. And uh, full disclosure. Uh, me and the host of the Shooting Star Podcast, Kyle, we uh, used to work retail together. And anyone who's worked retail knows that whenever you work retail with other people, you bond over your suffering. So go check out the Shooting Star Podcast. Tell them that the big fella sent you and you guys enjoy. You can all thank me later. So the news has come out that George St. Pierre is back after weeks, after months, after oh, agonizing days. Over speculation. George St. Pierre, I'd say enjoying obscurity. People had, you know, haven't talked about him in a while. And then he comes back and says he's ready to fight again. But he's a free agent. He declared himself a free agent. Now, whenever you're dealing with things like the UFC's contract that have been notoriously long, 60 pages, people expected to sign away their life and likeness, I would probably consult my lawyer before I went and declared saying, hey, bite me, Zufa. I'm a free agent. You can't just make those kind of claims. Rampage Jackson tried to do it, saying that he was a free agent from Bellator, even had a UFC fight, and where's Rampage Jackson right now? I'll give you a hint. He's fighting for a promotion that rhymes with Smellator. Okay? These contracts are ironclad for a reason. We are talking about a multi-billion dollar sports industry who wants to protect their interests in the people who fight for them. Especially... When you're a dominant champion like George St. Pierre was. When it comes down to the discussion of who was the best waterway champion of all time, two names come to me immediately. George St. Pierre and Matt Hughes. Now the ugly thing is, I didn't really care for either of them. I didn't care for Matt Hughes' abrasive personality and I needed no further evidence than him being a coach on The Ultimate Fighter Season 2. I thought Jason Von Flew, the live wire, was a great competitor for him and Matt Hughes treated him like, like dirt. Matt Hughes treated him like dirt. So that kind of said some things to me about Matt Hughes' personality. I don't know what the guy's like in public. I don't go to church with the guy. My kids don't go to school with his kids. I mean, he could be an absolute great guy and could have just been a TV kind of thing. But as a fight fan, as someone who consumes martial arts, all I have to go by is the public image that he gives on television and and in fights. So I just really didn't care for Matt Hughes. Didn't really care for George St. Pierre either, and it's not anything public or anything like that. It's just that he didn't get my pulse racing. It happens. George St. Pierre starred in a remake of one of my favorite movies, and I'm talking about Kickboxer. So when I, <laughs> I'm i sitting down doing the emergency prep for the Today's Prize Fight podcast, I'm sitting there thinking, man, you know, I might just have a problem with welterweights. And that was a cold realization to come to. I'm a guy who likes to pride himself on, hey, you know what? I welcome all kinds of fights, all kinds of fighters. I am all about everything that anyone has to offer, and I realized that I just might not like welterweights. So I said that wasn't real crazy on George St. Pierre, not on Matt Hughes. Johnny Hendricks, I think, was too big for welterweight. So who was the last welterweight champion that I really enjoyed watching fight? Well, that would have been Pat Militich. So if you look back at the history of the UFC welterweight championship, we have Pat Militich, Carlos Newton. He didn't really do it for me. Matt Hughes, and I've said my piece on that. George St. Pierre, Johnny Riggs, but now we're to Tyron Woodley. And he don't think he's done enough to be talked about in the echelon of great champions, especially in the welterweight division. Matt Hughes, as much as I didn't care for the guy, did some very impressive things, including 
knocking the snot out of Hoist Gracie. George St. Pierre had some great fights, knocking the snot out of Matt Serra. Matt Serra beat him, and then George St. Pierre came back, and this is when Matt Serra was a part of the UFC's uh, Ultimate Fighter Season 4, the comeback se- season, so there was a lot of drama to that. Matt Serra came back, won the Ultimate Fighter, won the Welterweight Championship, and then George St. Pierre said, I will take that back, thank you very much. But George St. Pierre is back, and we got to talk about well, what's his potential fights, because a man who is in the discussion of the best ever welterweight champion ever, we have to think, is part of the appeal, part of the goal, part of the ambition, getting him back into welterweight championship greatness. So, so of course, that puts Tyron Woodley in the map. Is George St. Pierre ever going to get a welterweight title fight? And if other divisions are indicative of how title shots are awarded, I have to say that George St. Pierre and his favorite niece might have a shot at the title because that's just what we do in the UFC title divisions now. Conor McGregor won the featherweight championship and he might have defended it in a street fight over cheese once, but then he went goes to lightweight and wins the title and he has to has to drop a title and he was a, a dual champion in two divisions, but he didn't really defend it. You see where I'm going. You see how messy this is. There is an opportunity for the UFC to really recalculate, rebalance, restructure their title divisions. And... Welterweight's not there yet, but it could be. Lightweight wasn't there until the notorious Conor McGregor got a hold of got a hold of that one, and we all know where Featherweight's been lately. Cody Garbrandt's a bantamweight champion, but I truly believe he earned that title shot. Cruz beat Dillashaw. Garbrandt beat Cruz. That's how it should go. Who's the who's the bantamweight number one contender? That's who should fight Garbrandt. But when you have champions and challengers, and you know fighting for every other sport but MMA and in every other division but the one they have the championship, that creates some difficulty. I would like to see St. Pierre fight Woodley, but I would like to see St. Pierre get some high-quality welterweight fights in him first. Just because George St. Pierre comes came back does not leapfrog him in the contendership for the welterweight championship, in my opinion. George St. Pierre has had a big layoff, a very big layoff. And so now he's going to come back in, and we're all happy. We're excited. Some more than others. Okay? So what, what do we do about this? Well, we get, him some, we get him some fights against contenders. Ultimately, I would like to see one of the best welterweight champions of all time get a title shot against the current welterweight champion. I think that's good for everybody. Woodley is the current welterweight champion. He's the man right now. Undisputed. If we put into consideration that the UFC attracts the best fighters gives them the best payday, then we can argue, we can reason that the UFC has the best fighters in the world by proxy. UFC has the best welterweights in the world by proxy. Woodley is the best welterweight in the world. We're talking about the transitive property here. Because the UFC attracts the best welterweights, because uh, the UFC has the best welterweights and Woodley is the champion of them, we can reason, we can argue, we can deduct, we can extrapolate that Woodley is the best welterweight champion in the world at the moment. George St. Pierre, one of the best of all time. Now, here's why I would be excited about that fight. Woodley is champion in a time when welterweights are much more abundant than when St. Pierre was champion. Fighters have evolved. Fighters continue to evolve. Guys who are fighting at welterweight tomorrow are going to be more highly evolved than welterweights of today. Welterweights of today, more highly evolved than the welterweights of St. Pierre's time. So we have a we have a Woodley, welterweight champion, who is champion in a time when fighters are more involved than when St. Pierre was champion, but St. Pierre is one of the best of all time, so we're kind of getting more to an, a level playing ground. If St. Pierre is going to challenge for the welterweight championship, I think now would be his time to do it. But let's get let's make it mean something, damn it. Okay? George St. Pierre is coming at, back from a layoff. He is not in contender shape yet. I mean, he, and he could have been training with Jean-Claude Van Damme doing splits and high kicks and and whatever they were doing on the set of Kickboxer Vengeance. But right now, George St. Pierre is not in contender shape. Let's get him some contender fights. Let's put him in the cage with welterweights who are contenders, who are ranked, who mean something. If, if St. Pierre can get through them, let's show him the road to Woodley and the welterweight championship. That's how I feel about it. Now, there was also talk back in the weeks where God knows who what was going on that he might want to challenge Michael Bisping. That makes sense to me, provided that he can beat middleweights who are ranked, who are substantial, who are in line to be contenders. If 
Bisping accepts a fight with St. Pierre. I think that changes things a little bit as long as the number one contender who has earned his shot is not getting the shaft on it. You see what I'm saying? Right now, UFC rankings are a little bit of a mess because we don't know who has earned their shot. And then St. Pierre is talking about also possibly cutting down to 155. And I think that is a god-awful, terrible idea. What is wrong with you? Did your mother drop you on your head? Reason being is, as guys get older, weight cuts become more difficult and more dangerous. George St. Pierre is not coming out to the Yachty in a wheelchair. But is he able to cut the weight like he used to? Johnny Hendricks was cutting down from like something ungodly, like 220 down to 170 when he fought St. Pierre. And he can't do it anymore. His body has aged. The body's ability to recover and be elastic to those sort of traumas, that, that timeline of being able to do that is finite. And I think George is on the wrong side of that. So cutting down to 155, I think, might be dangerous for him. The point of bringing up George St. Pierre today on the Prize Fight Podcast is that it's further evidence that fighters are taking bad cues and they are litigating in the media to get their point across. So McGregor... Oh, God, I'm so tired of talking about this. McGregor started his hissy fit, and I've identified it as the McGregor hissy fit tactic. Going to Twitter saying, I'm retiring, and, you know, thanks for the cheese, and then ultimately getting his way. And I think I said last year that that was a bad example. So George St. Pierre saying that he's a free agent and having a public feud about it, people taking to Twitter, ultimately someone got their way. And it could it could have been the UFC. The UFC could have gotten the deal out of it. However... St. Pierre has nothing to lose on this one. He could have sat out his contract. Like, there had to be a limit. Something had to have given. But St. Pierre got something. It's called, in contract law, it's consideration. George St. Pierre got consideration enough that he's willing to appear in the UFC again. Did hashing it out in the media help? Quite possibly. Do I approve of it? Absolutely not. I think that's why we need a fighter's union more than ever. Someone who's skilled at contract negotiating. So, they get... Someone who's skilled at contract negotiation, there. Someone who's skilled at those kind of negotiations where we can get fighters what they deserve, what they are worth, without have to take it to the media. Because sooner or later, we're gonna have a guy who there's we're gonna have a guy who's gonna be a champion who's gonna be at the end of his contract who's gonna be in the position to say, "Well, I'm not getting my McGregor money. I'm UFC light heavyweight champion. I'm UFC middleweight champion. I'm not getting McGregor money, so uh, I'm gonna walk." completely has the power to screw everything and can walk. And we can't condemn these fighters for doing what's best for them. You know, without without guys willing to strap on the gloves, without guys willing to step in the octagon, we don't have nothing to talk about. Without those fighters, I've got nothing to come at you every week with. I th- feel like that does give them a right to feel entitled to fair representation and fair pay. If I'm willing to plunk down money to see a guy fight, I feel like he should get a big share of that money because I'm not paying to watch the Ring Girls. I'm not paying to listen to Joe Rogan. I'm paying to watch two guys do Get Out. And if I'm paying that, I feel like they should get a big part of that. Do I feel like going into the MMA media and press to gain leverage is the way to go about it? No. I think that makes it look cheap for everybody. So, those are my thoughts. That is my contemplation. Do you agree with me? Do you not? Talk about it on Twitter, Facebook, leave a comment, make sure you like and subscribe, all that fun stuff. Tell me that you think I'm full of it. Shoot me an email at cagenationtv at gmail.com. Before the break, I want to talk about uh, Chris Cyborg Justino being cleared of anti-doping violations. She had tested positive for a banned substance and she was able to provide evidence that she was taking it for a medical condition. Because believe it or not, steroids and, and those sort of anabolic substances do have practical medical applications. Uh, my, my stepfather had had kidney issues and he was on steroids and it did wonders for him. Is he competing in the UFC? No, but the point is there are practical medical applications for it. Now, <laughs> uh, Cyborg is a natural featherweight. She should probably fight at lightweight if there was the competition for it. But uh, now that she's been cleared, she can fight. I need to ask myself, does that make her an immediate number one contender for J- Jermaine DeRendami? Am I saying that right? Jermaine De Randomy. Randomy? Randomy? Randomy. Randomy. Is she a contender? <laughs> Is she a contender? I think we're getting so close. But if so, and she does beat De Randomy, does that make her an immediate champion? And does, it mean, does that issue in the era of Cyborg? We're going to find out. Ladies and gentlemen, when we come back from the break, 
boxing is beginning their advance and assault on the world of combat sports. Don't go nowhere. It's the Prize Fight Podcast. Cage Nation TV would like to take a second and formally thank all of the businesses that have taken the time to sponsor a mixed martial artist or a boxer as they have trained to attain greatness. In the world of business, it can be looked at as an advertising expense to get your name out there. But did you know that your sponsorship dollars is actually keeping the American dream alive? Your help and support is actually changing the lives of aspiring athletes. Working hard and reaching for the brass ring is truly the great American story. We encourage all of our listeners and followers to support businesses that sponsor your favorite fighters. And thank you to those businesses businesses for your continued support and encouragement welcome back to the prize fight podcast of course i'm albert you're my adoring audience now truth be told i love you guys thank you guys very much for the for your listens for your likes uh, if you haven't done so already make sure you like the podcast make sure you follow us subscribe whatever we got to do uh, i definitely want to take cage nation tv the prize fight podcast to bigger better things just i want to i want to provide the best coverage possible so your support in doing so and liking and subscribing and telling other people to like and subscribe helps us get there. And it should give you a feel-good feeling. It should make you feel warm and tingly. Uh, closing out the Prize Fight Podcast, I'm following up on a prediction that I made in January for New Year's that I think that boxing is beginning to encroach on MMA as the combat sport. Uh, it's obvious to me that boxing is beginning to make their advance in their assault. And there's a couple things that are telling me why. Number one... You know who trying to fight you know who in a boxing match to the point where you know who started you know who productions trying to cut out the UFC to fight you know who and you know who and you know who agreed to you know what hundred million dollars but did they didn't they did but they didn't it, it's not going to happen statements are being made it's flying around regardless it is definitely showing the strength that boxing has uh, boxing certainly has tradition on us uh, boxing has they're superstars. They've got their their quality fighters. I firmly believe that there is enough room in the world of combat sports, in the forefront, in the mind, and the conscious of everybody, that boxing is and MMA can coexist. And can, not only can coexist, but can uh, interact with each other. So MMA fighters are wanting to box. Of course, you know who being the biggest one. Um, you don't see a whole lot more boxers trying to fight MMA, do you? I mean, Roy Jones Jr. and James Tony had their things, but you don't see... You don't see MMA fighters or boxers trying to be MMA fighters. Tyson Fury talked about it a little bit after after his issues, after he vacated the the heavyweight championship after beating Vladimir Klitschko, effectively ending the Klitschko era. Uh, Tyson Fury said, "Hey, you know, I'd entertain talking to Bellator. I've been talking to Bellator. I've had talks. There have been words we've exchanged, but nothing ever came of it." And Tyson Fury really wasn't even that interested in competing in MMA. He was more about the uh, kickboxing leg of Bellator. That's what he was looking for. And don't get me wrong, kickboxing is certainly taking their share too, but boxing is making the advances. Now, boxing news is also making uh, the bigger forefront in the headlines. Um, I'd like to thank guys like Osahan Omo Osagi and Matt Leishak for helping me gain that healthy understanding of boxing, helping me gain that that healthy appreciation of it. Uh, my first major boxing fight I ever watched was when Mike Tyson got out of jail. So Iron Mike Tyson fought the Hurricane Peter McNeely. Uh, and I remember being tired and sleeping through most of it, but I got my second win for the main event. And uh, I never really understood boxing or came to appreciate it. I felt the way of saying about MMA at first, but uh, I'd like certainly like to thank those guys for, for helping me get a boxing base boxing understanding. Uh, so when I say that boxing is making big forefront news again, uh, Canelo Alvarez's fights are in Sports Illustrated and, and ESPN. Uh, Miguel Cotto. With Creed coming out and Southpaw having come out. I mean, boxing is certainly making their moves again. Boxing movies are also a lot more popular. Uh, there was a boxing movie I watched a couple years ago called Grudge Match. And I absolutely loved it. And Grudge Match was a uh, kind of like a take of if Rocky Balboa and Raging Bull had gotten older and decided to fight each other, what would it look like? And I mean, it was a funny movie. But it also done done boxing right. MMA has yet to have a really good MMA movie. Warrior was close. But there are some things that got some cheesy about it. Boxing, of course, has had a couple of really good movies. Celebrities are now also making boxing appearances. Of course, I'm talking about Chris Brown and Soldier Boy Tell but also Curtis Jackson, 50 Cent being really into boxing, and, and Mark Wahlberg really being into boxing. Uh, there was a slump in some years, but it seems like over the last year or two, boxing's really been making making their advances. 
I've got this little device in my living room because I don't subscribe to cable. It's a little device called a Roku. And the Roku, you get different streaming channels. And uh, Golden Boy and The Ring both have a channel that you can that you can grab. And I love it. Man, boxing has become so much more easier to consume. And I don't know if it's because boxing knows they have to compete with Fight Pass. Uh, but they got some really good stuff. There's also an app on my phone called Fight TV to where I can see boxing matches. Uh, the Ring puts out the, this boxing program called LA Fight Club. Boxing's taking the hint, ladies and gentlemen. It's a lot easier to follow fighters these days. It's a lot easier to understand who's fighting for who and who's fighting for what. Good things are happening for boxing. One of the things that really made me take notice to to boxing improving its popularity and its social relevance has been the local sample. That local sample being the Steel City of Pittsburgh. Uh, Pittsburgh has had some great legendary fights. But boxing is really taking a foothold in Pittsburgh. Sammy Vasquez, Jun- Sammy Vasquez Jr. is a boxer out of Pittsburgh, and when he fought on uh, PBC last year, and even most recently, Pittsburgh came together to support their own. So Sammy Vasquez is getting some notice. Uh, Richie Canalina, the Raging Bull, former Complete Devastation MMA featherweight amateur champion, walked away from MMA to be a boxer. Now he's been doing great at it, but he's a boxer now. Dan Kakuda, the Bionic Fist of Justice, our guest on the Price Fight Podcast last week, floored me with the revelation that he was a boxer first. So I, I always thought of Dan as a very good kickboxer with great ground skills. But then you find out that he was a boxer first? That's absolutely incredible. Now he's getting back into boxing. Uh, Pinnacle Boxing Championships has held more events in the last six months than MMA has. I'm not sure what's going on with Pittsburgh MMA. I, certainly my heart is there with them and hoping they continue. But there has been more boxing events in Pittsburgh than MMA. Johnstown has become a hotbed for Pennsylvania boxing. Down here in Wilmington, the Azalea Festival has a boxing tournament that I'm really looking forward to. Uh, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about this and, and trying to chew your ear off. What I'm trying to do is just plant the seed of understanding in your mind. Competition is great for business. So if boxing's bringing the heat to the UFC, the UFC's got to respond in kind. And then they're going to improve. And then boxing's going to improve. And you know who wins? We all win as fight fans. So not a whole lot to chew on, but something to think about. Boxing certainly making some advances. And, you know, some exciting stuff's coming up. With the information age of technology, we're able to stream fights. You know, pay-per-view is always going to be wheelhouse. But what if pay-per-view doesn't evolve with boxing and, and MMA? Coming up next week on the Prize Fight Podcast, well, I have no idea. I plan on talking about you know who and you know who today, but that kind of pissed me off, so I threw that out the window. And I, but I, I felt like we had a good show today. I felt like we talked about some good stuff. So coming up next week, I have no idea, but I appreciate you guys listening. Make sure to like, subscribe, follow, tell your friends, send smoke signals, do what you got to do. But until the next time, ladies and gentlemen, fights, Cameron, action. Thank you for tuning in to the Cage Nation Prize Fight Podcast. All rights reserved 2016 to 2017 Planet Airy Sports. The Prize Fight Podcast is part of the Cage Nation Broadcast Network. For more information, visit www.cagenationtv.com.